It's interesting that the book of Esther is really written with this whole series of reversals. What begins one way ends up as the opposite at the end. So she begins her life as a young orphan Jewish girl and ends up as the queen. In, and we see other reversals such as Haman wants to kill Mordecai, wants to hang him. Well, Mordecai ends up getting the job of Haman, who ends up being killed on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. Shalom, this is Mitch Glazer, president of Chosen People Ministries, and I'm so glad that you're taking a little bit of time to join us. Uh, we're about to celebrate the Feast of Purim, one of the minor festivals within the nation of Israel, but not very minor really in its importance. Uh, the title for our video podcast is God's Faithfulness to Israel, Lessons from the Book of Purim for Today. This is a very important discussion because Israel is under threat. And we know what happened on October 7th and what's been happening for the last number of months. And it's probably not over yet, even though we're recording this obviously a, a little bit ahead of time, but I don't think it will be, unfortunately. And so I hope that by the end of this video cast that you'll be more eager and more encouraged to pray for the peace of Jerusalem because we really need peace. And here to help guide us as we look at the book of Esther and give a good little contemporary twist uh, on the book, I hope, is my dear friend, Dr. Helene Dallaire, who is professor of Old Testament and Hebrew language studies at uh, Denver Seminary in Denver, Colorado. She is a graduate from Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, taught there. Can you imagine that? A Gentile Christian professor of Hebrew at a Jewish reform seminary. That's a mouthful. And she has been at Denver for many years and is an, uh, a Hebrew grammarian. Uh, her Hebrew grammar textbook is about to be published by Zondervan as uh, will be a commentary on the book of Joshua. And so she is a wonderful guest to have because she knows her way around the Hebrew scriptures much better than this Jewish guy, believe me. And so welcome, Helene. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch, for having me on this video cast. You're, you're really welcome. We're so thrilled that you're here. So we're going to start easy and just mosey on through the story because as we both know, the blessing in the Jewish community for us at this time is to simply tell the story. And so telling the story is always a, a good thing to do, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at it from a few different angles. And so I'd like to begin by looking at three of the main characters, Mordecai, Haman, and Esther. Now, a fourth could be King Ahasuerus. My non-Jewish friends say Ahasuerus. Can you actually say that, Helen? You know too much Hebrew to even say that. Yeah, I call him by Xerxes because that's actually another name by which he is known. Yeah, Xerxes just, it is much easier to say. And so tell, let's talk about Mordecai and Haman and Esther. What kind of people are they? Where are they from? What's their background? And what's their role in the story? So why don't we start with Mordecai? Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, before we jump into the characters, maybe we can ask a couple of questions about what were they doing in Persia anyway? And so why do we have a story that's uh, about the Jewish people completely in Persia? And so we know the history of Israel. We know about the, the fall of the Northern Kingdom, 722, and then later on with the Babylonians, the Southern Kingdom. Uh, so we find out that the Jewish community in Persia had been there for about 100 years by the time the, uh, the book of Esther is written and the events in the book of Esther take place. So when they first arrived, there's no doubt that going into exile was very traumatic for them. First of all, they probably never thought that they would be taken out of their land for what seemed to be permanent uh, exit and living somewhere else. But uh, so traumatic experience. But after 100 years, you 
you see normally a community begin to integrate into society. So when we see, when we look at Mordecai, Mordecai already was someone who was established and already had, was recognized for his skills in leadership or else he would have not ended up working in the palace, in the court of the king. Mm. So he, he was a part of life in Shushan or in Susa and uh, was recognized for his gifts. And he had told people that he was a Jew. So it was known which uh, two people who worked with him that he was a Jew. So that was not a secret. Uh, although later on we find out that he tells Esther, keep that as a secret, keep your identity as a secret. But he didn't keep, keep his as a secret. So he was, uh, he probably uh, at some point was trusted by the king in order to be one of the people who was working uh, in the court of the palace or uh, in government or we don't know a lot about the details of his position before he was promoted to be, uh, to take the place of Haman. But he was obviously working very close to the king. So we uh, we know from him that he adopted his uh, second cousin, young girl Hadassah, who was an orphan, who was part of the Jewish community but had no parents. Therefore, he he adopted her. He took her under his wings and uh, took care of her. Until one day he finds out that the queen, Vashti, had been deposed and there was a, uh, uh, a beauty contest for, uh, for someone to take her place to become the new queen. So it's interesting when we read, and we read that in several passages, that someone is beautiful. They're beautiful of appearance and it usually becomes part of the plot. Uh, so we find out about Joseph. He was a good-looking guy who was in the in uh, the house of Potiphar for a while, and uh, Potiphar's wife was very interested in his beauty. And uh, but many times that becomes part of oh oh, there's something happening because of the beauty of someone. And you think of Bathsheba also is another one whose beauty is recognized and therefore ends up with. Uh, um, in a story that is very difficult story, actually, uh, that involves King David. But uh, so Hadassah, we, we read very early on that she's a beautiful young girl. So Mordecai suggests to her, why don't you apply for the job? And, uh, and which would have been quite an experience to spend about a year uh, going through beauty treatments and spas and, and being part of this this group of women, I'm not sure if that was always a good thing, a positive thing, a fun thing. It must have been uh, uh, intense sometimes. But he he suggests to her that she apply for the position that she, and she does. But I suspect that uh, maybe Mordecai had more hope in her winning the beauty contest than Esther, than Hadassah would have had, and whose name is eventually changed to Esther. But she does uh, become the queen. So I, I love looking at Mordecai and the decisions that he made without knowing the impact of uh, his decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's often the way the Holy Spirit works with us. I mean, it's the same Holy Spirit who worked with Mordecai to lead him, guide him, uh, prompt him to, uh, to make certain decisions or recommendations to Esther. Uh, so many times we do things without really having this great loud voice saying, thus says the Lord, do this. Uh, but we make decisions that impact. Uh, if we follow the Lord, we walk with the Lord. Often we look back and see the impact of our decisions and the words we spoke. And I see this in, uh, in Mordecai, that he was, he was not young uh, by the time that uh, Hadassah uh, presented herself 
to be uh, queen, to to be in the pageant, to be queen. So I think that Esther probably observed a lot of wisdom in Mordecai over the years, seeing how he lived and how he he uh, the important decisions that he made. So. Uh, I see him as being sensitive to the Spirit of God, not knowing that that's actually what he was doing. But uh, he, uh, he, once he was working in the palace, he found out there was a plot to assassinate uh, the king and uh, makes it known and ends up saving the life of the king. And here's another decision that he made no doubt led by the Holy Spirit, not knowing the outcome of, uh, uh, of this revelation that he was making. He, he, he saved the king, basically, saved his life. And uh, eventually that plays into the story of how Mordecai ends up being given favor. So I see Mordecai as uh, uh, probably senior in life, um, and but with much wisdom, and I, often he's compared to Joseph, because Joseph ends up coming from a humble background and ends up in a foreign land. Also, both of them end up uh, finding solution to a very difficult problem. Uh, they end up saving lives, both of them. They end up uh, being promoted to be second in command to a major leader. Uh, so very interesting journeys that both of them have and, and uh, interesting parallels that follow both of them. Um, I was reading um, about, you know, Esther and Mordecai and his life, and I was surprised by the comment of a, a commentator in uh, one of her publications, and she actually puts blame on Mordecai for the attempt at the genocide against the Jews in Persia. She says, had Mordecai not refused to respect Haman and had he bowed to Haman, then the story wouldn't have happened. And uh, But I don't like that approach. I like the approach of you stand for your principles. And even if you're countercultural or what you're doing might be uh, rejected by some people, but uh, I would never put blame on Mordecai. I see him as instrumental in saving the whole uh, Jewish nation at the time, at least the whole uh, Jewish people in Persia. So that was a bit of a, a surprise. So because I look at Mordecai as a wise man, a man with chutzpah, a man who was not afraid to uh, stand up for what he believed, a man who made wise recommendations. And so he's, um, yeah, he was a man of faith also, even though we don't read about God in the story, when he speaks to Esther, he says to her, if you don't go to the king to talk about this situation, uh, then there will be deliverance for the Jews from somewhere else. Right, and right. so although it never mentions God, God is all over the place and God is leading him constantly in decisions he's making, things he's saying, recommendations he's making. So it's uh, um, I see him as a very solid. Uh, well, without Mordecai, there's no book of Esther. <laughs> Do you, is, is there some hint that you can give us as to his religious life? I mean, there was no temple for him to go to where there synagogues that early or I mean what what was he about religiously you know it's interesting because this this question really is linked to how has the book been interpreted over time because there is no just, uh, talk of sacrifice thus says the Lord uh, religious tradition feasts celebrated uh, right. none of that is present all we know is that he revealed that he is a Jew and he makes it clear also that uh, Esther's identity is that of a Jew, and he speaks of his people. So I see him as very deeply anchored in his tradition, but we don't know how he lived it out. 
Right. I'll leave that to the rabbis for the Talmud. <laughs> yes, we need imagination for that, Helene. There's, there's just not a lot of information about that, but that's a great introduction to Mordechai. I mean, when you have a great story like this, inspired by, by the Lord, of course, but when you have a great story, uh, great stories usually have great characters, and sometimes we, we go past them quickly. So let's move on to Esther herself. And uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, her name change and, uh, and also her, her life situation. And I mean, when it comes to becoming, we mentioned the great beauty pageant of, of Persia, you know, I mean, with, was there Facebook ads that went out, you know, looking for beautiful Jewish girls or uh, how, how did this all happen? So I have so many questions about her as a person. Yeah, yeah. So we know from the text that she was a distant cousin of Mordecai and was adopted when she was young. Um, uh, so she was, uh, she, we know as readers, we know from the text that she's a Jewish girl. So that's very clear to us from the beginning. It's not clear to everybody in the, the story. At some point, they do find out she's Jewish girl. But uh, she is uh, named Hadassah, and when she uh, enters the palace, her name is changed to Esther. Some people have suggested that possibly uh, based on the root satar, to hide, or I think uh, more possibly in that context related to the name of the goddess Ishtar, uh, because it's not unusual to have name changes for Hebrew characters who are outside of their country in a different culture. We see right. this with Joseph. We see this with Daniel. And um, so we see uh, they go by their new name in their context. However, they're still linked to their original name um, uh, that that doesn't leave them. Their their original identity doesn't leave them, even though their name is changed because of the context where they live. So she becomes Esther, and we find out from her. It's interesting that the book of Esther is really written with this whole series of reversals. What begins one way ends up as the opposite at the end. So she begins her life as a young orphan Jewish girl and ends up as the queen. In, and we see other reversals such as Haman wants to kill Mordecai, wants to hang him. Well, uh, uh, Mordecai ends up getting the job of Haman, who ends up being killed on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. So you have uh, all kinds of of almost extremes, things that change from one extreme to the other. Uh, and we see this with Esther as a just very innocent young girl to begin with and ends up at the end of the story, there are some things, uh, I'll get back to this, but some things that are a little bit troubling uh, in the words that she says. But we see her journey going from innocence to uh, entering the palace to... Um, uh, living a life that she would have probably never anticipated. And uh, uh, and then we see her becoming more and more uh, unafraid to make decisions. She begins to take risks when she finds out that her people, the Jewish people, can be annihilated by a decision from uh, Haman that she takes the risk to go to the king without being summoned to the king, and she knows what the consequences can be. So I talked earlier about Mordecai having some chutzpah. Well, I think that he trained her well. She ends up having some she was chutzpah. A brave, she was a brave woman. Huh? She was. I think she yeah. was a brave woman. She was probably uh, following in the wisdom also of Mordecai, because when you... You see that before she goes to the king, she says to people, uh, she, she says to Mordecai, gather the Jews in Shushan and have them fast, fast for three days before I go to the king. One thing it doesn't say is it's fasting in prayer. It doesn't use fasting in prayer. We sometimes attribute that to her, that she fasted and prayed. Well, the text doesn't tell us that she prayed. But fasting was obviously something that was important that she believed in. And that's another place where you almost see that 
she believes in God or in her tradition or something will happen through fasting. Um, because, I mean, you look at Isaiah 58, very clear on what fasting does and why you fast and, and uh, other places in, in uh, the scriptures that she was probably taught by Mordecai, that she practices some things that are part of her tradition without God being mentioned. And there's, and there's a, uh, in religious Judaism, there is a fast of Esther uh, before Purim. And so, yeah, so Jewish people have picked up on that. And I don't know if the fast is three days, is it? Three days? I should know. But In the book of Esther, it mentions three days before she three goes. Days. But is the, is the Jewish tradition to fast for three days? I don't know if it's uh, three days before Purim. I think everybody gets so hungry for ham and tashin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jews like, I mean, a Jewish fast for a day is long enough, you know. Well, it may be that in some Orthodox settings, they may do the three days, you know. They might do it. And the reform may be just talking about it. <laughs> Missing one. <laughs> there you go. And so, yeah, so I love Hester's character, and I love her growth and her maturity and how she begins to take the lead after a while. So and one thing that's interesting is that her job as a queen uh, is not, and the same with Mordecai, their work in the palace is not simply a profession, not simply using your skills. But when we read the story, we can see that it's faith at work, you know, that right. God is working through whatever he has skilled you for or gifted you for. Uh, we may look at our life sometimes as I'm working, I'm teaching, I'm, you know, writing, I'm doing those things. But in reading stories like hers, you can see that God is all over the place in their calling, in their, you know, in the positions in which they've been placed. So I see this in uh, Esther. Actually, someone uh, wrote that Esther... Although the, the name of God is never mentioned in the book of Esther, that Esther wore the mask of God. And I thought that was so interesting. Well, that's very fitting because of the masks that are worn on Purim. That's right. right. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I don't, know if, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to wear a mask trying to look like God on Purim. <laughs> but yeah, that would be, that would not be, I wonder where they get the image from, you know. Yeah. So, you know, just, uh, it was someone who was talking about how God is not mentioned. God is very present. And so very present through Mordecai, very present through Esther also as this uh, wonderful young woman. I think that she probably uh, learned to listen to the wisdom of the elders because she listens to her uncle. She, mm -hmm. as a queen, could have said, forget it, I'm not doing this. And Mordecai would have had no power over her. And uh, But she had developed this ability to listen and to know what was right. And I believe that that was part of her, probably her upbringing in the house of, uh, of Mordecai. So she's, uh, she comes from the shadows and ends up in the limelight. So there's a real progression. The only thing that I find troubling uh, with Esther is that at the end of the book of Esther, uh, on the 13th of Adar, when the Jews are given... Uh, permission to deal with their enemies, that she comes before the king and she suggests that they do that another day on the 14th of Adar also. And so just reading this out of context makes her look like, uh, you know, she she's become so bold that she goes the extra step that is unnecessary po possibly. So some people have looked at it that way. Uh, so her presence as a very mild uh, character at the beginning of the book and her presence at the end of the book are two different things. Very interesting. Yeah. I don't know that it needs to be interpreted as a negative. No, but I mean, she becomes more assertive as, and more confident probably as she, goes, as she goes along. After all, at the end of the day, she saved the Jews. She did. She did.
Yeah, thank God she listened to Mordecai. She could as a queen, and and we see in this story, I mean, with others in leadership who are using their leadership skills for a very destructive purpose, while that is not the case for Mordecai and Esther. For them, so, it's to save lives. So thinking about this destructive work, and we see the, the hand of God. Some people say we see his fingerprints all over the book of Esther. So we see the hand of God, uh, but now we see the hand of someone else. Uh, we, see ha we see Haman and possibly the eternal enemy of the Jewish people working through Haman to seek the destruction of the Jewish people. So tell us about Haman. Now, Helen, I'm going to let you talk without saying boo, okay? Okay, go okay, so, hey, you know, Mordecai and Esther, we're going to shout yay, and Haman, we're going to say boo, but when people do that to me and I'm speaking, I lose my place, you know? And so we'll hold back, but tell us about Haman. Yeah, let's do that at the end. We'll give it a real, yeah, we'll, we'll let it, it all out. <laughs> Yes. Now, Haman, we know that he was in a position of leadership in government. Uh, he had the oversight of areas and he was working in the palace. So he was close to the king, actually. Uh, we find out early in the book that he is he's already working in the palace, but he is promoted to be above everyone else who is serving the king. So uh, he's now the second in command and has gained a lot of power. One thing we find out from him is that he's wealthy also. And we know that the king uh, was wealthy because he gave this massive, gave these massive banquets and ma banquets are, are throughout the book of Esther. But it be, the book begins with this massive banquet and this display of wealth for 180 days. Now, Haman was also a wealthy uh, person because when he made the deal with the king to destroy the Jews in the Persian Empire, he said to him, I will give you half of, of my wealth. So no doubt there was a... a a high value for him to be able to purchase the power to or the authority to uh, be able to destroy the Jews in the Persian Empire at the time. But the Jews are not for sale and never have been, never will be. And so yeah. it doesn't matter how much money you offer anyone, uh, that is never the way uh, to, to treat uh, the Jewish community. Now, you know, it's easy, especially right now with what's happening in Israel and Gaza. I mean, reading the book of Esther this year is different from reading the book of Esther in other years where we prepare for the celebration and dressing up and all this. This year, it's more painful because we know that what's happening with Hamas and uh, with Islamic Jihad and other uh, uh, other terrorist organization, Hezbollah in the north, that it's the attempt is uh, for a genocide, and that's always been the the agenda of of the modern terrorist organizations who have been tried for trying for decades uh, since 1948. Uh, but you know, it's not nothing new. Uh, it's something that has happened over and over and over again, trying to get rid of, of the Jewish people throughout history. But this case for Haman, I was thinking about that Haman, Hamas, sounds very similar, you know? <laughs> well, we just did a newsletter, and the title was uh, was Haman, Hitler, Hamas. Yeah. That's God right. will never let his people be destroyed. Amen. Destroyed. Absolutely. 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 And so in one sense, when I think of that, it's, that's the only way you can be comforted in, uh, in seeing what's happening in Israel and Gaza is that God will continue to preserve his people. Uh, and so that's never going to change. And uh, many have tried uh, for a long time over history. I wrote an article at one point and uh, uh, mentioned the, the times in history when uh, Jews were expelled from countries 
Um, I have this somewhere, uh, you know, from France, from England, from Spain, from uh, Germany, from uh, it's it's a recurring theme. And people ask the question, why? Why do this with the Jewish people? Not believe that, uh, you know, they're, yeah, it's a good question. It's not, I don't think it's an easy one to answer, but there's always been an enemy of the Jews, always. And uh, when um, some are more direct, some are more ruthless, uh, but it's always been... Uh, at one point in Egypt, when uh, the the Israelites became so numerous that they became a threat to an insecure Pharaoh, uh, rather than working with the community and, and uh, helping them continue to thrive, no, uh, insecure people become threatened and then they use violence and they use destruction in order to get rid of the threat. And often, you know, as God blessed his people, said he would multiply them as the, the stars of the heavens and the sand of the sea. Uh, the Jewish people have never disappeared and never will because uh, God promised that uh, even in the eschaton, they are part of the eschaton. So God has a plan to work through them. The Messiah came through, uh, through them. Messiah was Jewish. And... And all along history, there's always this idea of someone rising up to the, who hates the Jews for some reason and tries to get rid of them. So that's how I see uh, Haman. I was trying to think, you know, if somebody, if a counselor were trying to counsel him, what would he be diagnosed with? <laughs> that's, that's, I've never thought of it that way. I mean, actually, yeah, but he was a human being. Anger, anger, anger problems, maybe? Oh, you know? beyond that. Actually, as I was rereading what we know about him, I came with the, the, the diagnosis of narcissistic sociopath. Yeah, and, that's uh, a good one. <laughs> I think the, you're, you're yeah, closer. Yeah, definitions of narcissism is someone who is excessively self-absorbed, someone who has a God complex, someone who has an exaggerated self-importance, uh, uh, a view of themselves, and, and has no empathy for anybody else, will crush anybody else who might be in the way, someone who doesn't have good relationships with people. And, and uh, the only person he had seemed to have a good relationship with was the king because the king was the only one who could crush him. But he uh, ended up, because of his, his uh, pathology, uh, he ended up uh, going the extreme in, in living out this hatred of the Jewish people because it talks about destroying, killing, and annihilating. In the text, right. it specifies the three, and then it adds women and children. Well, think think about that one because of what just happened on October 7th, you know, that the enemy of our souls, the devil, is using uh, Hamas and Hezbollah and other uh, human tools to destroy the Jewish people. But you're right. It's, 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 it really crosses a line of humanity. There's no humanity in it because of the way that elderly people were treated, the way that women were treated, the kidnapping of little infants. I mean, when you think about this, it's it's like walking through the book of Esther uh, in, in so many ways and, and uh, walking through October 7th and even walking through the earlier chapters of the book of Esther are very dark and, and seemingly hopeless. But, but we know that we have a God of hope who keeps his promises and preserves his people. And I think that that's so important. But you need, you know, the good guys need a really good bad guy. And, and Haman fulfilled the role, didn't he? He sure did. But one thing is, you know, people ask the question, why is this happening to the Jewish people? Why? And another important question, I think, is if they are created in the image of God, how do they get to that point of wanting to commit these kinds of atrocities? And I see Haman in that category no concern for humanity at all, willing to right. kill, destroy, maim, do whatever needed to, to be done to get rid of what they 
seem to think is a problem when in reality from God's standpoint is not a problem at all. And uh, so how did the story end, Helene? Uh, with Haman, yeah. What, what was what was Haman's ultimate end? <laughs> That's right, and that of his sons. And it, right, exactly. And his wife wasn't too thrilled about Haman going against the Jews because she understood that the Jews were attached to, yeah, correct to God. However, she's the one who suggested build the gallows for Mordecai. Yeah. Well, who knows how she really felt about her husband, you know? Yeah, that's right. And I wonder what happened to her in the end. You know, we see the 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 end of the story as as the sons, Haman and the sons, are right. are killed on the gallows. But what happened to Zeresh? You know, did she turn? Did she uh, come to her senses? Uh, because we do hear stories of former terrorists who whose heart was touched by the Lord, whose lives were changed. I think of Tasa'ada uh, sure. in uh, Jericho and how the Lord got a hold of his life. Uh, you know, you hear testimonies. Occasionally I heard one of a Hezbollah who ended up uh, uh, becoming a believer. And I think it's important for us to listen to these testimonies to give us hope that yes. Everyone is created in the image of God. Therefore, there is possibility for everyone to be reached by God. Now, people still have to make a decision, but some are so living in such darkness, uh, you know, Sinwar, Hanye, and all the, the leaders of the terrorist organizations and those who serve them. I mm. think what kind of dark life they live in, but God is able to pierce through that. I believe that. So we have to we have to pray for all of them, and and not just for judgment, which is the temptation. I think it's fair to pray for judgment, but I think we need to pray for their salvation uh, as well. This it's a very good point, Helene. I think all of our viewers will appreciate that very much. It's difficult to see what's happening, but you think there's not just hope for the Jewish community, Jewish people. There is hope for the perpetrators. Right. No one's beyond redemption. So yeah. so um, underlying the uh, story, of course, so the name of God is not there, but his handprints and uh, are there and maybe uh, a, a mask that Esther wears, you know, but I don't know what the mask would show. But uh, giving, you know, I understand what you're saying. I, I think that the good characters in, in the book of Esther give God a face, in, in a sense, and a, a, a real tangible reality. Uh, but underlying the surface is, is something that I also find, find very interesting, and that's the outworking of God's covenant with Abraham. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell us a little bit how you see that? So we don't exactly see the name of God mentioned, but we see his handiwork and, and we see his covenant with the Jewish people, sort of, we played out in the book of Esther. Do you see that as well? Yes, yeah. But one of the promises that I see for sure is the the seed of Abraham, you know, will live forever. And how many of the promises that are part of the covenants, not just with Abraham, but renewed with Isaac and Jacob and right. the Mosaic covenant and with David that talk about Leolam, forever. And right. so what God said he would do forever is give the land, bless, and multiply the seed. And there's never a point in which, in my understanding of Hebrew, leolam means leolam. It means forever. So the, the continuation of the, the unfolding of, of, uh, uh, of what is part of all the covenants is that the Jewish people continue to live and until Yeshua comes back, you know, until the end of days. And um, God so, still has a role for the Jewish people. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So the book of Esther, unlike the Torah, unlike the, the historical books, unlike the prophets, uh, it doesn't, it's not written in such a way to tell us how the Jews live their religious life. 
And so it is a story of how God delivered them from genocide, but it's not describing how they, uh, they worked out Torah in their lives. The book is not written that way. It's uh, almost absent of this kind of detail. We, just, we see God throughout, uh, as you mentioned, the imprint of God throughout the book and uh, decisions that are orchestrated by the Lord. But it's not to reveal a working out of lifestyle, of Jewish lifestyle or religious lifestyle. So when we think sometimes of the covenants, people think of, you know, practices uh, it's a uh, way more than practices. The living out is is something that is part of an expressions of the call of God on the people. But that's not the only way. I think the Holy Spirit works through his people and works in the world uh, in such a way that often we don't know. And it's not through religious activity. It's not just through sacrifices and and so the book of Esther is not written uh, to give us the, 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 like in the prophets, for example, how many times the, the prophets confront the community and say, you have turned your backs on God, you are worshiping other gods. Well, we don't find any of that in Esther. We don't mm -hmm. see even Mordecai or Esther or anybody else from the Jewish community worshiping other gods. So, so the tone is different. And right. so it's a story of genocide. It's uh, it's not a story that is meant to uh, to say, okay, based on the covenant, this is what uh, should happen in the Book of Esther. Now, I think that the absence one the absence of the name of God in the Book of Esther is is has created the a scenario where. Uh, all kinds of interpretations have been, uh, uh, have, you know, people have come up with all kinds of interpretations of the book. For example, that it's only a comedy, that it's a satire, it's a story, non-historical mm. story that is similar to stories that were written at the time just to entertain people. Um, and so that is uh, actually, you find that in a lot of the literature in, in many commentaries, interpret the Book of Esther as non-historical uh, uh, comedy and uh, that is being replayed year after year through the celebration of what is written in the Book of Esther as uh, not, not as a historical event but as a, a story of, uh, uh, yes, God delivered his people, let's rejoice mm. uh, type thing. So my position is that it's, uh, it describes historical events because uh, why would you have names of kings who existed and dates uh, of when they existed and the number of days when their feasts would be and, and uh, talking about how many um, uh, provinces they controlled and usually you have this kind of information when the material is historical right. and so or else you can write a comedy without uh, without any of that um, at one comment that really surprised me by uh, a good scholar uh, a Jewish good scholar who takes the non-historical approach and she, she wrote, understanding the book of Esther as a comedy allows us to recognize that the threat to the Jews is not real. I read that a couple of times and thinking, what? Uh, and, you know, so of course, if everything is allegory, if everything is, is uh, uh, comedy, then you don't need to take the seriousness of... Uh, the threat that was there against the Jewish people. But history shows that this threat is is real throughout history. And yeah. uh, uh, long before Esther and long after Esther. And, and just when we thought the threat was minimized, uh, the threat is back in, in full force, even with the growth of anti-Semitism in the United States, which has been documented by the Anti-Defamation League and others as being three or four times uh, as many as uh, happened prior to October 7th. So the, the incidents of anti-Semitism are coming rapidly along with our what's on our campuses. And 
I think we have to extend the hope of the book of Esther that there is a God that you may not always see him present, but this is a God who is faithful to his covenants and promises, and he won't allow the Jewish people to be destroyed. You know, the common saying is out of the ashes of the Holocaust, Israel was born. And, you know, there are parts of that statement I don't like, you know, especially because I have family who died in that. Mm -hmm. But so it's for me, it's not a sort of an, an exercise in, uh, uh, in, un, in trying to understand it. I mean, it's a real thing that happened that was, that was horrible, you know, and there's nothing that you could say to actually make it better. But on the other hand, it is true that the world did gain sympathy for the Jewish people and supported the formation of the state of Israel in 1948. Uh, the British backed off and people were allowed to come back in. And I mean, all these things happened, I think, because people said, well, the Jews have suffered so much. Why not let them have their own land? And of course, they, they didn't know really that God was using them to let them have what God had already given them. But, yeah. Yeah. but, it, but it is true that uh, when these hard things happen, we can more easily see the hand of God in redeeming and, and saving and preserving. And uh, I think I read in one of your recent publications that the number of people making Aliyah is growing exponentially and is, is anticipated to continue to grow uh, in the next few decades uh, yes. at large numbers, that they're building uh, a lot of apartment buildings, even though many areas can't even be inhabited right now but that yeah. uh, the Jewish people are coming home. Yes, that's, it, it's good to see. Um, and uh, we praise God for that. And uh, we have 30 staff members in Israel, Helen, so bring them on, bring them on in. You, you te I always tell people who are concerned with making sure Jews get to Israel, I say, well, you send them and we'll take care of them once they come. You know, yeah. We'll find ways to help them and tell them about, uh, about Jesus. Um, we're getting close to the end, and I want to ask you a, a question, um, because I grew up with this, and uh, so I grew up with all the Jewish traditions involving Purim. That was actually, um, my, my fa I'm not sure most of my family members ever believed in God, but boy, did they love the holidays, <laughs> and, and Purim was no different. And uh, so I'm just wondering, for you as a Gentile observer that's been a long-term member of a Messianic congregation, a great friend of the Messianic movement, uh, living and teaching at a Jewish school. So what have you seen that, uh, that really strikes you as, as traditions that are just so enjoyable and fun and meaningful? Yeah. I remember when I lived in Israel, one of the things I loved to do at Purim is walk in areas where there were a lot of synagogues so I could listen to the reading of the book of Esther and listen to the yay boo <laughs> see I'm so I'm so used to it I wouldn't I would I wouldn't notice it you know yeah for That's me great. it was you know it was a new context and I was discovering so many things wow. and uh, just falling in love with the land with the people with the traditions and and of course continuing my studies in the Hebrew Bible yeah. But also, uh, you know, I see in the early church, the first century church, uh, how they celebrated the feasts. So Yeshua celebrated the feast. We see him at Hanukkah, which is not necessarily a biblical feast. So he must have celebrated Purim because if, uh, you know, they are told to celebrate this every year. Helene, I just don't know how I feel about Jesus going boo and yay and wearing and being involved in a Purim play, but, but, but then again, then again, he was circumcised. He was bar mitzvah, you know. So why not? And he certainly celebrated Passover. So yes. I'm sure that Jesus, Jesus must have done everything. Yeah, and, but uh, I, I so think much. that a lot of the modern traditions were not necessarily the two thousand year ago <laughs> traditions, and yeah. so I think the word is anachronistic. It's a big word, but it means. Don't read the new into the old. So, uh, so what what is your honest opinion of hamantaschen, and what's your favorite kind of hamantaschen? Oh, um, 
well, I like them all, but I like raspberry. I like which are not the original kinds. I think it was more um, dates. I like the dates, poppy yeah. seeds. Uh, yeah, so I'm just very thankful that stores carry them around Purim. So now I want to. I have an exegetical question from the Hebrew. So, so they're called Haman's ears. Yeah. Why? Or Haman's hat? Is it because of the shape or what? Yeah, I think what I've read is because of the shape, but who knows? I mean, mm-hmm. when, who are the first people who baked hamantashen? You know, uh, it's no. not not. I mean, I don't see that in the Book of Esther. That's definitely not not a question I can answer, but but I'm I'm happy to eat them all year though. Oh yeah, yeah, that work. Yeah, you you live in an area where you probably have a lot of wonderful things. Yeah. All the- Brooklyn has a few places where you can get hamantash. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it's fun now because in the messianic context where I worship, of course, we celebrate Purim and the kids have a play and. Is it a different different script every year? Do they make it relevant to the contemporary? I don't know if they'll change this year to make it a little bit more uh, modern. Yeah, modern for the story. But the kids, uh, our uh, Shabbat school teachers, are wonderful. They write the scripts and and yeah. they you know do the the choreography and so we're blessed to have people who are gifted in that area that's one of the joys of going to a messianic congregation and friends if you don't go to one go visit one during purim watch the play eat the hamantashen and uh, have a great time because we're happy that god is preserving the jewish people and we pray that god will continue to preserve the jewish people and we pray that god will release the hostages that he will intervene And uh, we have so many heartfelt concerns for our beloved nation of Israel right now. And I know you do, Helene. Listen, do you have a a final word on the book of Esther? This has been wonderful. I think that the book of Esther is uh, written in such a way that when we look at how dire the circumstances are in Israel and Gaza, that we can still have hope because God is... God knows, and God is there. And we pray, we fast, and uh, the hand of God is is all over people as we pray. So there is hope. There is hope. Thank you, Helene. Thank you so much. This was wonderful, and I hope all of you will have a joy-filled, wonderful uh, Purim. And remember to eat some hamantashen, and my favorite is the prune-filled hamantashen. So I know it doesn't sound that good, but give it a try. God bless you, and thank you for joining us.